Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the first installment of our CBC Spotlight series. This is our top opportunity to take a deeper dive into programs, opportunities, and experiences that make CBC great. Of course, my name is Jim Brockman. I am on the admissions team here at CBC. I am also going to be your host for this season of Spotlight Series, and we've got a great lineup for you uh, that'll be coming to you all throughout this summer. Of course, before we dive into today's Spotlight Series, uh, I do wanna talk a little bit about some upcoming opportunities for you to find out more. Of course, all of these are going to be done virtually, so keep in mind that every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., please join us for Coffee and Conversation, CBC Coffee and Conversation. Uh, we'll provide the coffee, you provide the conversation. Uh, you can register for this event by going to www.cbchs.org slash register slash. Um, everybody who registers and then attends a coffee and conversation will receive a Starbucks gift card from us in the mail. Uh, this is a great chance for us to connect um, answer direct questions that you have about CBC High School. Um, we can uh, talk really about anything you want. Of course, uh, every Thursday then, uh, we've got a very special opportunity for your sons to join us. We are calling this CBC Chick-fil-A and Chat. This is your son's chance to join us and our students to ask questions that they might have about CBC. Really, it can be a about anything they have interest in, uh, but we'll have a great variety of CBC students that'll uh, join and answer questions uh, from a student's perspective. Of course, that's every Thursday at 12 p.m. And of course, uh, any student that joins us, uh, we will provide the, uh, the Chick-fil-A, uh, they will provide the chat. So we'll send him a Chick-fil-A gift card. Uh, and if you're here right now, you know that every Wednesday afternoon at 1 p.m., we've got our CBC Spotlight Series where we do take a deeper dive into a program, opportunity, or experience here on the campus of CBC. Things like the academic program, the honors program. Uh, we've got our leadership program. Uh, of course, we've got our fine and performing arts program and many more. So lots of great ways to connect with CBC virtually. Of course, um, you can always register for these events by going to www.cbchs.org slash register slash. These are great ways for you guys to find out a little bit more information about CBC. With that being said, it's time to jump right into our first ever CBC Spotlight Series. This is our STEM Academy. And so uh, without further ado, we have two very, very special guests with us today from our STEM Academy, Mr. Joe Hankin and Mr. Philip Stapleton. Joe, Philip, welcome. Thank you guys for joining us. Thanks, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for having us. Awesome. It's good to have you guys. Joe, why don't you kick us off? Uh, give us a little bit of background about you, who you are and what you do here at CBC. Sure. So I'm a, a second career teacher. I've been teaching for 20 years now in the, in the STEM field. Um, a lot of science, a lot of math. Um, and in the last 10 years or so, last eight years or so, uh, more and more engineering. So as the world has kind of changed, uh, we've recognized this need that our education processes need to change as well. So um, as we move forward, we can see that students need to be better problem solvers, better creative thinkers, those kinds of things. And a lot of that just wasn't being addressed overtly in, in standard uh, math and science education. One of the things I said when I became an engineer, it was in spite of my education, not because of it. Um, and I don't think that's good enough. So what we're doing is we are intentionally introducing STEM to, this, to these kids, engineering, computer science, these kinds of things for those students who are like-minded and want to take that a little bit further. Excellent. Thank you. And of course, Philip Stapleton. Philip, you're, uh, you're uh, relatively new here, although, gosh, are we going on five years now, Philip? Uh, this will be my fifth year. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it flies, flies by. So, Philip, you, uh, you and Joe team up. What do you do, though, on, on, your, on your side of the STEM program? Well, as I said, this, is, this will be my fifth year, but I have, uh, this will be 18 years in teaching. Uh, and 15, four, yeah, 15 of those is in computer science. So I, I, I come more with a computer science background. Um, we know that computer science is critical in today's day of 
technological you know advances so uh it becomes a big part of what we do here Excellent. So you guys team up and you guys obviously have taken two different angles of STEM. Joe, you deal a little bit more kind of uh, in more of like the traditional engineering side. Is that correct? Sure. So yeah. that's my background. So I uh, was an aerospace engineering by engineer by education. I have my, uh, my, my degree in aerospace engineering. And I worked at a company called Rockwell Collins, which is an avionics company. And I worked as a systems engineer. So we brought together a lot of the hardware requirements, the software requirements, and then the customer requirements. We kind of brought them all together and made sure everything was being met and being tested and everything. So um, after several years of doing that, I decided to get into the teaching game. So I bring that experience with me. Um, the one thing uh, I've done some coding, but the one thing that I haven't done a ton of is um, a lot of the well, let me say this. My coding always took place pre-internet. So a lot of these things that we see are happening on the internet, the coding aspects, that's that dates uh, me. So um, I always tell people in my, my parents' day, everybody learned how to um, do handwriting. In my day, everybody learned how to type. In my kids' day, everybody learned how to keyboard. And now the essential skill is coding. So that's just the way the world works. Yeah. You don't have to be a coder to need code. Um, it's just part of the way the world works. So that's why it's so great to have Philip aboard who has these experiences and has these expertise um, in these fields. And together, you go yeah. ahead, John. I think, Jim, that's what I was going to try to uh, emphasize is together, we make a pretty good team because we have kind of them both covered. Yeah. Yeah, I think together you guys, I think, cover a, a really wide spectrum of uh, the STEM field. And we know that every day it seems like something goes by, that STEM field grows larger and larger, right? So uh, it's almost kind of like the uh, the hamster on the wheel, always trying to you know catch up. But Joe, just talk real quick just about what, what is the overarching goal of, of a STEM program or the STEM program at CBC? So you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's changing so fast. Um, and I even talked about it when I learned coding, it, you know, it was a totally different thing. The world of STEM is just changing so fast that we cannot teach content per se. We, you know, teaching them a language or teaching them a certain skill isn't enough. Um, we need to provide opportunities where they can take and answer their own questions and see the authentic application of the processes and not be at a loss if they run into trouble. They know how to handle adversity. They know how to ask the right question. They know how to dig deeper and, and do the research and they know how to run tests and all those things. So if you were gonna hold me, to, hold me to on the spot, I would say opportunity. Um, it's not about giving them what I know or what Philip knows. It's about giving them, preparing them to be able to answer their own questions and to find out things on their own, which is really the way engineering works. Yeah. yeah that, that makes Sorry, go ahead, jump in there, Philip. I was just gonna say, I would just add to that. You know, it's, and I think a misconception is that it's, it's skill training, and it really isn't. It's, it's life changing is what it is. Um, I think also what we do is prepare them and STEM as a, as a whole, it's preparing them to be active and um, even inform contributors, you know, in our, this, this world that we, we live in. Yeah, I know that that makes a ton of sense. And and Joe, I, I you know I hear you say to the guys all the time, you know, when I'm I'm in there, you're in the the maker space right now. Uh, I love when I hear you say this. You know, my my job is not to teach you everything that I know. My job is to provide resources, remove roadblocks, and get the heck out of the way. Right? I mean, the the kids when they have the passion um, and the interest, the learning is going to happen. Um, again, it's not about the content, it's about preparing them, right? Um, we see so often in, in, like even in my education, it was about what the teacher could do for me, what the right. teacher could give me. And I, I'm not really giving these kids, you know, from myself, I'm providing them a way to give to back to themselves. I'm really kind of, it's in them, it's in them. They may need some guardrails, they may need a support once in a while, they may need, you know, a little bit of advice on on best approaches but it's in them and my job is just in philip's job we're, it's just there to bring it out and let them find it for themselves 
Yeah, that, I think that's how we see even just education in general. I mean, I know over the last five years at CBC, um, teachers have really shifted from uh, less of the sage on the stage, right, to more of the guide on the side or the learning coach. And and this is no true, I think, then in our in our STEM program and the way I, I see you, the way you guys interact with with the guys who have taken your classes. So let's let's get into it. Let's dive right into it. Let's talk about. Um, we've, we've got kind of like a three-legged stool uh, in the STEM program. You've got curricular, so the classes guys can take. You've got co-curricular opportunities. And then you've got this like whole batch of like self-directed opportunities for our students. So Joe, just, just take us through curricular. I mean, do I, like we got like one or two STEM classes. Or how does this work? Jim, hey, first of all, I love your analogy of a three-legged stool, but I wouldn't even stop at three legs. I would say there are four legs. Um, to me, the, the first responsibility I have in this great makerspace um, is to support all the other teachers in the building because STEM education has, is, is a shift. We don't think STEM education is for science and math and engineering only. Everything can be taught through a STEM lens. The idea of trying things and, and prototyping and seeing what happens and working and being active and we're uh, learning from your uh, mistakes and all those things. STEM is a way of learning and that way of learning can be applied across all curricula. So it makes my day when I have, say an English teacher come to me and say, hey, can my kids use the makerspace for a project? Can, you know, we're working on something in religion. Do you mind if we use the 3D printers? That makes my day because to me, that shows that that STEM shift is happening throughout the building. So, of course, we do have our own curriculum. Now back to your, your leg. <laughs> we you. do have our own curriculum, um, and it is more than just one or two classes. So um, it is something for all levels. So we typically would urge our students to start with one or two classes. Um, the first class we'd like them to take would be Principles of Engineering, which um, is a class that sometimes gets misunderstood because I think a lot of times people think of principles of engineering as kind of a survey course and they they expect they come in expecting to know um, what does a mechanical engineer do what does a chemical engineer do and, and that's not what we try try to do a there are too many types of engineering new ones being created every day and b it's constantly changing and being reframed so we, we make no attempt for that we can support kids as they learn but our principles of engineering class is more about what do all engineers have in common? The engineering design process, um, learning from your mistakes, um, you know, algorithms, writing an algorithm. You can have an algorithm in computer science, everybody understands that, but you can have an algorithm in any kind of problem solving. So we, we try to teach all these things that engineers have in common, and that's what we focus on. And that really sets the stage for the rest of our classes. Uh, the other class that we've just introduced is a makerspace prototyping class, and this kind of harkens back to what we were just talking about, is the idea is we're going to teach freshmen explicitly how to use everything in the makerspace because we want them to use the makerspace to support all of the project-based learning that's going on in the building. So we're going to teach them explicitly how to use the CNC machine or the laser cutter or the 3D, 3D printers. Because when, when, they comp, when they get into English and the teacher says, I want you to make a project, that's where their mind goes. Hey, I can use a 3D printer for this. So we want that to kind of come first in their mind. So those, those are kind of the beginning classes um, on the engineering side. We also have things like engineering drafting with both pencil and paper and, and AutoCAD. We do um, uh, aviation science is a new class that we're offering this year. We're, students will be able to actually um, take ground school and it'll become FAA certified for ground school at the end of the semester. Um, one of the things we like to do is we like to take that again, back to what we have been talking about. It's not about what I can do for them, it's about what they can do for themselves. So one of the things like uh, Principles of Engineering 2 is a class that is a big departure from Principles of Engineering 1 because frankly, it has no curriculum. We, we give the kids an opportunity. Again, it's all about opportunity. We give those kids an opportunity to select a project, some kind of project on their own, and then they have the rest of the semester to use all those great skills we talked about in Principles of Engineering 1 to make that project come, uh, come to fruition. Everything from building a guitar, building bridges, Arduino projects, remote control tricycles, you name it. So these authentic pro projects that they can kind of use in, in their uh, 
in their projects. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. And really, I mean, Philip, that kind of this dove, dovetails then into you a little bit because, you know, Joe talks about authentic projects and real solving real world problems. Um, no better is that found than in what you do with, <coughs> with our uh, computer science program. Yeah, and I think it's important to understand that the computer science program here at CBC does blanket all three, all four of those areas we that Joe mentioned, from curricular, co-curricular, self-directed, as well as that blanket shift uh, of teaching and learning throughout the building. Uh, and I think it's important to understand as well that the computer science curriculum here covers a broad range of those foundational topics. Uh, for example, like programming, uh, algorithms, no mention algorithms and engineering as well. Uh, the internet, how about big data? We know how big, how important that is. Uh, privacy, digital privacy and security. And what about just the societal impacts of computing as a whole? And so curricular wise, some classes or courses that are available to our students that tackle all of these topics or uh, intro, some intro level classes are like game programming. The, the students love that class. Um, because one way that we can still introduce the topic of programming algorithm, but not in a daunting or scary way, we found that um, a lot of students in the beginning would take our computer science classes and see all these lines of code. Well, that was a foreign language to them. They didn't know what to do with that. So it's scary. So by developing classes like game programming, which uses a more a drag and drop or block method of programming, it's a lot less intense or scary, if you will. Um, it's, it's a lot friendlier, user friendly as well. So by doing uh, something like that as an intro level, it they're able to transition to more advanced classes uh, like intro to computer science without the fear or uh, not knowing what they don't know. They have the foundation that they can go into more advanced classes and uh, be successful. But there are other classes that also um, touch upon these foundational topics that I mentioned, like uh, mobile app development, uh, web development, um, uh, cybersecurity, which is going to be a new class next year, uh, in this upcoming year, uh, which is, just sweeping uh, schools across the nation, I think. Uh, and we know how important uh, digital and privacy and security privacy is. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think you hit on some things. So, I mean, some real life application. I mean, cybersecurity uh, every day, um, you know, you get millions of people who, whose identities have been stolen. You're talking social security numbers. I mean, all those sorts of things. And I understand that we launched this class, uh, you know, I, I guess we uh, debuted it to our students uh, at registration time. And how did that go over, Philip, with, with the students at CBC? So I, I think it's fair to say that, you know, we kind of been testing the waters with this prior uh, to actually having the class by having a club and, you know, having that club and having the feedback from our students that are already involved helped a lot as far as how to navigate and create this for our upcoming students um, at our at the um at the uh, i'm sorry i forgot what you called it <laughs> well, registration <laughs> registration thank you right, you right. Know, i think there was a lot of interest yeah uh, for it you know again cybersecurity is everywhere you know right. we hear it everywhere Parents know about it. They're familiar with at least the terms. Everyone may not know exactly what's all involved, but they know those words. So, um, and I think everyone knows the importance of that. So it was definitely something that was everyone was interested in. And they were happy to hear that we were transitioning just from a club to an actual class that will take it deeper. Right. Yeah. No, and that makes it that makes a ton of sense. You know, uh, Philip, you, you mentioned uh, uh, clubs, right? So uh, you are currently in um, our robotics lab, right? So let's let's shift gears from the curricular to more of the co-curricular. Uh, of course, you mentioned robotics as a class these guys can take, but it's also a co-curricular opportunity that these guys can be a part of. So talk a little bit about robotics. 
So, uh, well, robotics as a co-curricular is a great way for our students to get that hands on. And, and Joe mentioned it really, truly. He mentioned it earlier about our, our curriculum as a whole is about problem solving. And as a co-curricular, it's doing the exact same thing. Our robotics teams uh, you know, that formed the club, they get in here and they learn on the spot. They fail, they problem solve, and they adjust. And it's not us telling them at all, you need to do this, oh, here's what I would do, or here's how you fix your problem. It's them using the engineering design process to figure out what their problems are, and hopefully <laughs> in a timely manner, uh, able to solve them. Yeah, and you talk about, you know, you think back to uh, real world application. I mean, we step back and we look at big picture on this thing here. Um, these guys, many of these guys, I mean, they're, they're four years, our freshmen are four years from graduating high school. They're another four years from graduating college. So they're like eight years from entering the real world. And, and certainly we can't predict uh, what that real world is going to be in eight years. So for us, do we think every one of our kids who are in a robotics club or take a robotics class, are they all going to be building robots? No, but if they can be critical thinkers, if they can be analyzers, if they can be problem solvers, if they can work in groups and teams, and if they can create and come up with solutions, we believe that that's something is going to be employable no matter what industry they go into. So um, that's, you know, I know I've heard you give that pitch before to, to a kid who's maybe on the fence a little bit about robotics. Uh, Joe, talk from your perspective a little bit. I know we've got we've got Boeing Engineering Challenge. We've got Sea Perch. We've got, I mean, we've got a lot. Talk about, you know, what are you seeing from your side? Well, let me first address back to robotics a little bit. Um, we've really developed the program. So it's kind of a hybrid between a club and a class. Um, there is a club that you get credit for called advanced robotics, but there's also an introductory class. So one of the things we see, we see is the, the, the advanced team is so student-centered and so uh, student-driven that we were seeing beginners come in and, and feel like they couldn't make a, uh, a meaningful um, contribution. So what we did is we introduced this idea of introduction to robots, where we will actually teach them um, more than we do in most of our other classes, specifically how these things go together, how do the gear ratios work, how do the coding work, all those things. So you know, they're learning freshman year about, or, or in their introductory class, how those things happen. And then in the advanced class, then they're really taking it further. So even though they're getting credit for that advanced class, it is still kind of a, a co-curricular. Um, they do it in the X period before school, the competitions are on the weekends, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is just one of many competitions we do, one of many things. Um, one of the things we see over and over is that companies and higher education, they are reaching down into high schools like never before. Um, worldwide Technologies and Enterprise and Boeing and uh, Maryville University and Missouri s and 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 the Navy and the Air Force, they all have programs that they're offering to uh, high school kids so the high school kids can get engaged and we just don't say no to anybody. Um, we do everything from Billiken Beams, which is bridge building with St. Louis University, uh, Boeing Engineering Challenge, we build gliders and with Boeing engineers and test them. Uh, we have an aviation club where we have a whole whole bunch of contacts and we'll go to Scott Air Force Base one day and then we'll go out to Lambert the next day and then we'll have a pilot come in and talk to us here the day after that. So we have an aviation club. Sea Perch is an underwater rover competition where the kids literally build the rovers, throw them in a pool and race through an obstacle course. Um, the big one that we enjoy a lot is called the Gateway Arch in, uh, Engineering Design Competition. It's put on by the National Park Service down at the Arch. Um, it is a very authentic competition. They bring us down there and they say, this is what we've got. This past year, it was mobility in, into the um, Arch elevators. And if you've ever been in the Arch elevator, you know they are not conducive to uh, mobility issues. So that was their, their challenge. They needed a way, they had they wanted ideas. How can we make this mobility more, more uh, available to those with mobility issues? So that was a real issue. Um, and we had to come up with a real solution. And 
I'm happy to say we've won that competition two years that we've been in it. So that's a growing competition, but it's an authentic one. And it really gives the kids a taste of um, how engineering works. And a lot of that is done with uh, the Engineering Club of St. Louis. So we can make some contacts there. We actually had one of our kids who was in that competition win their scholarship this year. Um, but we also do things that maybe aren't as um, commitment heavy. Uh, for instance, um, the NHRA, which is the Drag Racing uh, Association, has a STEM day. So one day, all, all the kids who are interested or sign up will go down to the drag strip, meet the drivers, meet the mechanics, see how that kind of thing works. Um, home builders in a box, right? If these kids are interested in construction, they can meet some of these representatives from these companies who are looking for help right away. So we're not only looking for these kids who have these outstanding, you know, going to going to save the world by inventing new and better, you know, there's, there are kids who are going to go right into the workforce and they're going to save the world that way. And we're trying to help them both. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. And I mean, we talk a lot about opportunities within the STEM program. I mean, I think I can speak for, uh, at least from our perspective, uh, at your own peril for both of you, uh, we don't say no too much, right? I mean, it's always a new competition. It's a, a new opportunity, a new guest speaker, uh, all those sorts of things. Now, talk to me about um, the the self-directed. So you get a kid who comes in. You know, Philip, you you got a kid. You got kids who come in. Uh, a lot of these kids have been coding uh, since they were five. It's their language, right? Um, so that kid just doesn't step into computer science one, does he? Or how does that work? Like, what are the self-directed opportunities? What would we do for a kid who says it really advanced? So, Jim, if I could go back just a, a little bit to co-curricular, because I think it leads into self-directed as well. Good call. Um, you used the word opportunities. And to me, that is the key. That's what makes these co-curriculars work is because they give these students opportunities. And those opportunities, I think, I believe, lead into more of the self-directed exploration, if you will. Um, I've had students many times say to me, well, I don't know if I can do that when it comes to computer science. You know, when I've asked them, hey, do you want to be a part of this hackathon, which is an opportunity for them? I don't know if I can do that. I don't know much. And I, and I say, just try. You'll be surprised at what you will and will not know. And then they get there and they realize, oh, I can do this. So, you know, and that leads to more self-directed learning. Uh, so a lot of the co-curriculars, you know, we do as well as the engineering. We also do other co-curriculars like uh, hackathons with UMSL or a STEM student forum with uh, Worldwide Technology, Global Hack, even a Cyber Patriot competition. And all of these co-curriculars also give more opportunities for our students to explore, to learn, not just from themselves, but from others in the, the business as well. And again, I believe this leads to self-directed. So um, we've had students form clubs that they formed on their own without our guidance. For example, like the animation club, um, which I'm very proud of a, a couple of students started that one and they have taught other students what they know and they basically, you know, lead the learning. I honestly don't know anything about a lot of what they do, but that's OK. Uh, again, it's self-directed. So they're not only taking their knowledge and learning at their pace, but they're learning and doing and exploring and failing and succeeding and problem solving. And, and it keeps, it goes further than that. You know, we've also uh, introduced a new class this year, uh, computer science practicum. And in that class, again, it's, it's basically a self-directed class. These are students. We had two students piloted this year, uh, one for animation, the other in mobile app design and development. Um, and what we learned from interviewing them surveying them is that what they got out the most out of that having that type of learning was that they own it they own that learning and they were willing to take more risks uh they weren't they could go as fast as they needed or they could go as slow as they needed they were i found that they were more willing to ask more questions uh, because again they're owning the learning 
It's not me guiding them on, okay, today, this week, we're going to focus on this content specifically. They focused on the content that they needed and they wanted. Yeah, and that's, I think you, you make a great point. Thanks for uh, for kind of making that point. Um, a lot of the co-curricular opportunities excite guys enough where they want to take it further. Um, of course, the classes excite them sometimes to go be part of the co-curricular opportunities. Um, Joe, talk about uh, real quick, just, just practicum courses. What, what do we do there? Um, and, and how do we support those really highly motivated kids who say want to quote unquote, major in STEM while at CBC. So they're taking, they take computer science one in freshman year, they take computer science two in sophomore year. And now what? Talk to me about that. Right, so we understand, and Philip talked about how some of our um, courses like game programming are set up to kind of ease kids into it. But we also understand that some of these kids are coming in at a high level. Uh, we've had kids come in who are already consulting and we've had kids coming in who have already been working um it, it's the world is different it's not like it used to be companies don't care about how you learned what you know they only care about what you know so one of the things is these are the kids we especially want to stay out of their way we can't expect to take these kids who are blossoming and have interest in let's say vr coding we we don't have enough kids in the building to support a class for that but we want to be able to support them in in their pursuit of it so that's what the practicum class is for they can take that class and they can pursue it we have the same thing happening in the engineering world in the poe2 class we have kids coming in who um, are more advanced or want to take it on or they really want to do a deep dive right so that we can support that in poe2 so across all the the stem type courses we give them a chance to really dig deep into what they're interested in and we meet them where they are. And that means at a high level, as well as at a low level, we can bring them in and we can keep nudging them forward no matter what level they're at. Yeah, that's outstanding. And that, that practicum, I think has been one of the biggest uh, uh, benefits to the high performing STEM student. Uh, we, we, we continue to remove roadblocks and provide them resources and allow them that pursuit, which is, which is just awesome. So uh, you guys have talked about a lot. Uh, Philip, you talked about the new and emerging cybersecurity. Uh, Joe, I heard you you mentioned just kind of briefly aviation science. Let's reel that back just for a okay. second here. So you you said that we have an aviation science class and and we're partnering with uh, somebody at Spirit of St. Louis. Right. So talk about the aviation class. Uh, I'll walk through it from the beginning. So my background is in in uh, aviation. So I've always had an interest in, in it. And a couple of years ago. Uh, I had a contact that was going to be in town or something. I don't remember, but we started a club and we started it's called the aviation club. And what we do is we look for ways we can get these kids hands on engaged with um, airplanes, rockets, whatever we, everything from NASA engineers to stunt pilots uh, to the blue angels. They've all been involved with us here. Um, and it, it was a real hit. I mean, just kids coming out of the woodwork. And it turns out we had several pilots at the time, uh, parents of pilots and they were bringing kids and showing them their airplanes and we were getting special access to the airport and all kinds of great stuff and we realized through talking with them that right now in, in uh, aviation there is a real shortage the the aviation community is hurting for pilots um, and that's why they were also generous with their time so we decided uh, to take that first step so one of the things is we have a lot of I wouldn't say a lot, but we have a few pilot students who are pilots in the building. And uh, at the time, their biggest problem was they didn't have the time. They have school, they have work, they have sports or whatever. So we decided that let's give them the time. So we are we have decided we were moving forward with a company called uh, Elite Aviation. It's at Spirit of St. Louis Airport, and we will teach a ground school course. So when you are a private pilot, you do not have to um, do this first, but you would typically do it concurrently. So you can study to get your private pilot's uh, certificate, your FAA certificate through uh, this company, Elite Aviation, by taking our class here. The other thing that class does is if you are, are already a pilot, it gives you an opportunity to set up time with your instructor. So we have t students who have uh, instructors uh, flight instructors who instead of coming to CBC first period will go to the airport first period, fly with their instructors and then come in as part of their school day. Um, this has been, it's been very well received. We, um, 
kids can't wait to get their hands on it. Uh, it's just such a fun and, and unique opportunity that students are really excited about it. Yeah, and so so talk to me about this, Joe. So I don't have uh, I don't have my own instructor. Um, I, I haven't been hooked up with the lead, but I think I might have any I have some interest in flying. Like, uh, what what do we do for that kid uh, here on campus? Perfect. So we will make uh, we will have trips. They're going to support us at Elite, so we will go out there and we will see their planes and their operations and things. But uh, the thing we did, we invested a couple of years ago in an FAA certified flight simulator. So we have a Redbird 2. It's a, it's not a full motion, but it's a full vision. It's got three screens and it's got a realistic uh, Cessna 172 cockpit. And it flies, it's got a map, it's got the whole thing. It's got all the airports. You plug in your airport, you can plug in your approaches, you can plug all that stuff in. And it's like you're actually sitting in a Cessna 172 uh, GPS. So the beauty of all that is we will be able to teach you how to use all these things and how to set the VOR and how to use the NDB and how to tune the radios because we have them in class. No, we don't have an airplane, but we have the next best thing. So we will be using that. Um, and the beauty of that is you don't have to pay somebody to rent their airplane so you can sit on the ground and figure out how to use the GPS. You've got one right there at your fingertips. Yeah, and I'll see if uh, Ryan's our producer. I'll see if Ryan can bring up our uh, our a picture of our flight simulator. Joe, talk to me about maybe the next. Uh, what's the next evolution in in becoming a, a pilot? So, like, what are what are we seeing with technology, and where is this all going? So, one of the things that we're seeing here, and this is Andrew Akel in the picture. Andrew uh, came to us as a pilot. He was a student pilot. His dad is a pilot for uh, um, UPS and has brought us out there many times to climb aboard his airplane and everything else. And here you can see he's uh, he's using, um, looks like he's got his hand on the throttle there and the GPS in the middle and everything else. So Andrew is actually studying to be uh, a pilot right now at Oklahoma State. Um, and he's he was very instrumental in kind of helping us get started. So the technology is kind of, um, you know, the COVID thing has kind of thrown a wrench in, in the, the travel industry, but the need for pilots is still there because one of the things we see is that drones have really emerged. So we've had drones for some time and we you know, we have a few, I think, I don't know, eight or 10 of them and we, kids will fly them around and everything. But what we're seeing now is that can be a career path. We're seeing these students who can get certified commercially through, that, through the FAA, it's part 107, and they can become pilots and they can, you know, whether that be using them with the police to search for people in the woods, whether that be taking pictures at the game, whether that be you know what, making commercials, so that path to being a to being a drone pilot in in the public, so everybody can fly a drone, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners already have drones, but they're <laughs> not allowed to fly them in the public. There are a lot of restrictions on on the airspace, but once they get F AA Part 107 certified, then they can start to fly those commercially and in different with different uh, ease of restrictions. So that's the next logical step for our aviation uh, classes is to not only do pilots, but to do drone pilots as well. Yeah, and you talk about that opens up a completely new career path um, that that five years ago, maybe we weren't even exploring or our kids weren't exploring. That's exactly uh, it was a novelty, right? Yeah, totally it was. It was a novelty. Somebody got a drone in your neighborhood and you got to watch them fly it. Um, and that obviously speaks to the opportunities that you and Philip have, have put together. So um, I, I personally know both of you guys. Uh, both of you guys are super humble guys. I'm going to make you brag on yourselves for a second. Philip, I need you to tell me a success story uh, from, from STEM Academy. Give me a success story. Uh, okay. So this is actually for both Joe and I. Uh, we had a, a, a former student who just, I think he came back last year, uh, uh, Michael Love is his name, and Michael took several computer science classes, um, and he got involved a little bit in co-curriculars, but not a whole lot. But one of the things that I did in classes, you know, in some of my classes is I would have guest speakers also come in to help out as well, or to give their wisdom. Well, that led for uh, opening up a door for Michael. Um, 
because of that connection, because of that opportunity, uh, we went to uh, Worldwide Technologies for a field trip uh, for our Intro to Computer Science class. And uh, Michael got to, to not only meet, but speak to uh, a worker there. And since then, Michael has graduated from CBC. Uh, he is at SIUE, I believe it is. And he came back to thank us, myself and Mr. Inkin. And he said something that you say success to me, this is the, the, the essence of this success. It's not necessarily what they do, it's that they, he got something out of what he's doing. He gets it, you know what I mean? He see how what he's doing now is changing his life. So he went on to tell us that he thanked us because, because of us and the opportunity that we gave him in computer science, he met some people at Worldwide and he is now interning in their user experience department and he understands how this is going to change his life. It's given him a path and an avenue that he did not have before. And he was just very grateful and thankful. And we don't always hear that. And again, it's for me, it's not about, um, he went on to make a lot of money. It's that he gets how this is changing his life. That's more important to me. That's awesome. Yeah. And I obviously remember Michael, a great kid. And um, you talk about the importance of maybe just a teacher just saying like, hey, come do this with us and let's go. And, and it's, you know, uh, sometimes enough to get them started. Joe, uh, recently we've had a uh, one of our students in the news, right? Uh, talk a little bit oh, yeah. about uh, what Ben Young has done. So last semester uh, was last semester uh, during our POE2 classes when the um, COVID broke out and we all got sent home. Well, I had one kid named Ben Young who uh, his project was uh, a plasma generator. Well, you can't really do that at home. He really kind of needed what we had here, but it turns out his dad was a doctor. And at the time, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, was really hard to find. So he took it upon himself and um, did a lot of research with CDC and everything else. And he called me one day and said, can I use our 3D printers? So he took our 3D, some of our 3D printers home and had been printing PPE for not only his dad, but as word got out, we were sending them all over the country. We were sending them, we just sent some, some to Washington DC. They were up in Peoria, different schools were inquiring, um, doctors, dentists. And then as the second wave, as things started to reopen, then more people wanted them. So hundreds and hundreds of, of these things we had to produce. And that was all a student initiative. And that's a, that's a great example of one of the things um, in project-based learning that we say, if your project is not changing the world, then it's it, it could be readdressed. And his project definitely changed the world. Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome story. And again, we talk a lot about authenticity through our project-based learning, and there's it's clearly authentic, um, solving real-world problems in the moment, and, and quite honestly, saving lives. So, uh, very awesome, gentlemen. Uh, we are about out of time here. I just want to uh, take the opportunity on behalf of the admissions team to thank both Philip and Joe uh, for being part of this. Um, Joe, what's what's the best way to get a hold of you and Philip if, uh, if people had more questions or follow-ups? I think email is probably the best way. Um, I He's flashing them down below right there. Um, Philip and I are two peas in the pod. So if you eat, get one of us, you'll get you'll get both of us. Um, contact school and just mention STEM and they'll send you right to us. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Philip. And I, I think, uh, you know, from, from our standpoint, I know we're uh, unfortunately didn't get to host uh, Summer Academy. I know both of you guys are very uh, instrumental on our Summer Academy program. Uh, for the last several years, you guys have been a big part of that. So, um, but uh, I, I thank you guys for for joining us today. Um, and uh, hopefully, if uh, you know people have uh, questions or want to continue the conversation, they'll reach out to you. So, Correct. thank you guys very much. Thank, thank you, you, Jim. It was a pleasure. Thank yeah. you. And Ryan, let's uh, let's go ahead and wrap up now uh, our first ever spotlight series. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, for joining us here. Um, Keep in mind uh, several opportunities for the remainder of the summer. This is our first of a series of installments for Spotlight series. Um, if you weren't able to uh, to get this broadcast, or if you were able to get this broadcast but you want to join us for another one, um, all you have to do is register 
by registering, we will be live like we are now, but we will also record these and we will be able to send them out to you so you can see them uh, at your leisure. So make sure to register for all of our Spotlight series if you have interest, uh, there's a lot of great information. In addition to that, uh, keep in mind every Tuesday and Thursday, we've got our coffee and conversation in the morning. We've got our Chick-fil-A chat in the afternoon. We are also hosting tours, uh, in-person tours here on campus um, with, for families who are comfortable with that. Uh, you would simply have to uh, reach out to us and let us know that you would like a uh, personal tour here. Uh, and I'd love the opportunity to meet with you and uh, answer questions that you have. And of course, show you our, our beautiful campus. Uh, you can register for all of these events by uh, checking uh, cbchs.org. That's www.cbchs.org slash register slash. Um, so that's a great way to get in contact with us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for our first Spotlight Series, and we hope to see you again uh, very soon through all of our virtual opportunities. Uh, for Ryan Batliner in our production studio, for Melissa Ryan on our admissions team, I'm Jim Brockman. Uh, we'll see you again very soon. Take care.